Hey friends, welcome back. So in today's show, we're going to talk more about berberine and the differences between berberine and dihydroberberine. There's a lot of fervor and a lot of confusion in the internet community about the absorption differences between standard berberine hydrochloride and dihydroberberine, which has been proposed to be a better form of berberine. But you need to understand some physiology and how berberine actually works. So for background and perspective, Western scientists are publishing some 700 articles every year on berberine and the interest in berberine keeps getting greater and greater. Berberine has been used used in traditional Chinese medicine for the past some 3,000 years for uh, diabetic-associated diarrhea and, and gastrointestinal issues. And way back then, it was figured out that, well, when these diabetics take berberine, their blood sugar improves. And that's why we're hearing so much more about it now. And so what is the difference between berberine and dihydroberberine? Well, it turns out whether you ingest berberine hydrochloride or dihydroberberine, it's actually converted back into berberine inside the gastrointestinal tract. So there's this complex oxidation reduction back to oxidation step that actually occurs within the intestinal epithelial tissue. So it's actually quite interesting. So if you give, say, or if you just take dihydroberberine because it's five times better absorbed based upon some animal model study, actually there's no detectable dihydroberberine in your blood. It's actually berberine that is floating around in the blood as well as other berberine related analogs that are converted by your gut bacteria. So the idea that we need to optimize berberine so as to improve absorption is not really based upon the evidence and we should actually be looking at berberine more of a probiotic. Now I know that might sound a little bit counterintuitive because you're thinking well in order to get the benefits of taking berberine or dihydroberberine, you need it to be systemically absorbed and go to the systemic tissues. But how berberine is actually working is on the gastrointestinal microbiota and shifting the gut ecology and thereby improving overall metabolic health. Berberine is very poorly absorbed. So is metformin. Metformin is widely recognized as one of the most powerful and actually most benign diabetic drugs out there. But it's very poorly absorbed. Only about 28 or 25% of metformin is actually absorbed. So you might be saying, well, shouldn't we optimize the absorption of metformin? Well, maybe not, because how it's working, we're ignoring this whole organ known as the microbiome. So how metformin probably works in terms of improving longevity and blood sugar health and better outcomes when it comes to cancer and prevention of dementia and all these different conditions that metformin has been shown to improve it's probably working on dysregulated gut bacteria, and that's likely the, the best way to explain how berberine is working as well. So if you want to spend extra money on dihydroberberine thinking it's better systemically absorbed, I would encourage you to actually review some of the articles that we're going to talk about now where they show that that's not how berberine works. So what the scientists have actually shown is dihydroberberine, again, is oxidized back to berberine where it's absorbed as berberine. So even if you take dihydroberberine, for the theory that it's better absorbed, it's actually being back converted to berberine anyway but it's missing that potential step of improving gut bacteria. So one of the papers we're gonna talk about today is titled Interactions Between Gut Microbiota and Berberine, a Necessary Procedure to Understand the Mechanism of Berberine. And so we know that improving metabolic health is linked with improvements in the gut microbiota composition. And because of berberine's low bioavailability, it's been speculated that berberine can influence the gut microbiota composition and metabolism by directly interacting with gut bacteria and thus assisting in the amelioration of diseases. So we need to sort of mentally think of berberine like a probiotic. It's not something that needs to be optimized or emulsified or put into a liposome for systemic absorption. It's working like a probiotic. When you think of probiotics, you're not thinking about how to optimize the absorption because you know that probiotics are functioning within the organ of the microbiota and in, in the gut. And that too is probably how berberine is impacting systemic and metabolic health. And so here's figure one from this paper and it talks about how berberine is interacting with the gut bacteria. It's improving tryptophan metabolism potentially. It's, it's uh, affecting trimethylamine oxide production. It's also affecting potentially butyric acid and other short chain fatty acids in the gut and all of which culminates in better metabolic health. And so the scientists say that the mechanism of action of berberine on the gut microbiota of rats with high fat diet induced mediated insulin resistance, and I know that's a big word. And so essentially in studies, when scientists are trying to induce metabolic disease in animals, what they do is they give them processed food. So a lot of canola oil, sunflower oil, soy oil, along with corn, and that's how they change 
unfavorably the gut bacteria and cause insulin resistance. So the increase in fasting glucose, fasting insulin, and homeostasis model assessment of insulin resistance caused by this processed food, high fat diet feeding decreased after berberine treatment. In addition, bifidobacterium and lactobacilli were enriched and E. coli was inhibited after berberine treatment. You might be saying, well, what is with E. coli. Why should we care about the relative shift in bifidobacterium and lactobacilli and a reduction in E. coli? Well, it's been long known that E. coli is a gram-negative bacteria, and you have about five grams of gram-negative bacteria in your gastrointestinal tract. Gram-negative bacteria harbor on their extracellular surface a protein that can be problematic called lipopolysaccharide. In fact, if you were to get in a, a bad car accident or get a laceration or wound or a stab wound, wound or shot, what happens in sepsis is all that gram-negative bacteria is leaking from your the sterilized compartments of your gut into your systemic body, and it, it causes septic shock. Now, a lot of people, when they go and eat processed foods and high fat, uh, particularly liquid fats, fried foods, french fries, uh, canola oil, sunflower oil, soy oil, they actually get low-grade sepsis after each meal, and that is linked with the post-meal insulin resistance and all of the metabolic disease. This low-grade sepsis, known as metabolic endotoxemia, is a huge driver of metabolic disease, and it turns out that berberine helps to ameliorate that, and that's probably its main mechanism of action in addition to other mechanisms like we talked about, increasing short-chain fatty acids like, like butyrate and potentially reducing trimethylamine oxide and all that. So again, we have to think of berberine like a metabolic endotoxemia neutralizer probiotic. And I know that sounds like a lot of big words, but it, it needs to, we need to move away from systemic absorption. And I've seen this story with curcumin as well. People take curcumin for joint disease, for longevity, for its purported brain effects. But a lot of people are trying to increase the systemic absorption of curcumin. But it turns out that these curcuminoids probably function by way of improving gut ecology and affecting the gut microbiome, which then has systemic anti-inflammatory and metabolic issues. And so berberine needs to be put in that same category, like a probiotic, not to be monkeyed with or optimized in terms of its absorption. So just think about that. In other animal model studies, a berberine hydrochloride treatment was shown to enrich firmicutes and decrease bacteroidetes and proteobacteria in high-fat diet-induced atherosclerotic mice. In addition, high-fat diet-induced atherosclerotic mice, actinobacteria, rose bacteria, platia, and all of these other bacteria that I can't properly pronounce were reduced after treatment with berberine hydrochloride. And so essentially what these scientists go on to provide evidence for all the different ways that berberine favorably changes the gut microbiota and that's linked with better metabolic improvement. So I just want to help you shift how you view berberine in terms of its clinical importance, in terms of supporting metabolic health away from systemic absorption and think about it more from proving the composition of an imbalance balance gut biome. And that's what uh, multiple lines of evidence in both animals and humans suggest is that berberine is improving the gut ecology and that improvement in the gut ecology is linked with better metabolic health. It's not so much about the systemic absorption, it's about what it is doing in the gastrointestinal tract. So again, if you want to pay more money or you want to try to chase systemic absorption of taking dihydroberberine, that's fine. But just know that it's actually converted back to berberine before it's being sent into systemic circulation by your gut cells. But it might be missing a key step, whereas berberine is being converted to other metabolites that have favorable effects on the microbiome. So I know this was a little bit confusing, but I just wanted to share this evidence with you and help you recognize that berberine is more like a probiotic. So just understand that when you're thinking about how to use it. And when do you take probiotics? You take them with food. So um, if you're going out to eat, say, fast food, or you're going to have a cheat meal that's high in liquid fat, maybe a milkshake or some pizza, you might want to consider taking berberine along with that meal to potentially reduce that, that liquid fat or that high fat uh, processed fats in particular and carb combination from causing low-grade metabolic endotoxemia that has complications when it comes to metabolic health. Hopefully you found this video helpful. I'll link some of these studies in the description below and we'll catch you on a future one down the road. As always, thanks for sharing this video. Thanks for hitting the like button and we'll see you later.